Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you all for being back. I hope you had a nice lunch and stretch break. And uh, I'm, re I'm really pleased to welcome my colleague, Suzanne Kelly, the CEO of the Cypher Brief, a leading national security platform, and Dan Hoffman, who is currently a, a, a national security senior correspondent with Fox News and a former senior CIA officer and also served on President Trump's intelligence advisory board. Uh, they're going to do a question and answer interview session uh, for about the next 25 minutes and then leave about five minutes, five to 10 minutes for questions. So uh, you're on. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ken. It's a, an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I have to just uh, start off by um, saying hats off to you for your interest in sort of national security issues and how that relates to what you do professionally. Um, given your past, it's understandable, but I'd like to thank you and I'd like to thank you to that Southwestern as well. I'm having trouble talking today, it could be fun. Um, I just wanna also say that Dan Hoffman um, is also my interview subject, but he's also a Cypher Brief expert. And um, just in full transparency, um, we are very proud to work with Dan um, as we at the Cypher Brief try to figure out what events mean um, we all know what happens, but we don't always know what it means. And he's one of the people who lends his expertise to helping us figure that out. So I want to get that out of the way as well. But Dan, it's nice to see you again. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the panel. <clears throat> so I thought we might start off with talking about the national security aspects um, of what um, we'll call Savannah, Havana Syndrome. Um, other people have given it different names, which I think adds to the confusion. Um, but let's start off by talking about, you know, this recent CIA report. It was an interim report. Um, it seemed to uh, create more questions than provide answers. It, it, it's been very difficult to sort of seed through um, what the report found. But they did say there was no um, sort of massive worldwide campaign. In, in the way that this was uh, worded, it made it sound like they weren't ruling everything out, but they were ruling out a number of these cases that had come forward. Um, it, it doesn't mean there's no problem here. What did you make of that CIA report? And then we'll talk about some of the other reports. Yeah, I found it very uncomfortable. I felt like uh, the CIA was kind of lifting the veil on on how the CIA does analysis, but mid process. So they were making conclusions, um, but they were of an interim nature. And you're right, they, they said that they ruled out what we call Havana syndrome in like a thousand cases. There were still 24 cases that were unresolved. Uh, to me, it just meant unresolved. I, I think the interim report frankly caused more consternation and more questions uh, than it did kind of clear up what we think might be happening. So I, I agree with you. It seemed to me like a case of almost burying the lead, um, which is those 24 unresolved cases, which they're still, you would assume, actively looking for answers for. I, I'm curious though. So uh, on a broader, broader sort of national security level, um, we had in this morning's Cypher Brief Open Source Report podcast, which is where we sort of comb through all of the headlines of the day and things that are going on around the world. The fact that Kamala Harris is getting ready um, to go to Europe uh, she's going to be appearing at the Munich uh, Security Conference that's coming up this month. Um, and she has already had uh, an incident where there was some warning ahead that there may be an issue in previous travel. Um, I'm wondering, how is it that um, both State Department officers um, and CIA officers are, are sort of getting the confidence to continue on um, with the fear of this? And I'm going to categorize it as sort of fear of this because we don't have answers yet being out there. How might that impact the national security mission? I, I think it has a great impact potentially. Um, you know, uh, back when he was Secretary of Defense, Secretary Gates was asked once by one of the soldiers uh, where he met a war zone he was visiting about what kept him up at night. And the soldiers expected him to say Iran nuclear program, North Korea, terrorism, whatever those, those key issues are that we're focused on um, in our national security team. And he said, no, you do, all of you people do. Uh, because I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to take care of you. That is the first order of business. If you're leading uh, brave men and women who are putting themselves out there serving in harm's way to detect threats and preempt them before they're visited on our shores. And in this case, we've got people who reportedly uh, are government officials who have been hit with these anomalous health uh, incidents, um, Havana syndrome in Asia, in Europe, uh, obviously in Cuba, 
Uh, in Russia, very clear example there, Mark Polymeropoulos, who had to retire from the CIA, um, and including reportedly uh, staff of Director Burns when he traveled, staff of, of Vice President Kamala Harris. So all of that and the fact that there's no resolution and no clear indication of what's going on causes people to be concerned, causes their families to be concerned. I can tell you, I spent three years in, in, our, in war zones overseas and, and that drove my family batty you know, when I was overseas. And, and I could only imagine uh, the trauma, frankly, for family members, you know, knowing that their loved ones are in, in harm's way. And that makes it hard to do your job. It, it is um, one of the greatest fears, I think, is fear of the unknown. And unfortunately, there are still a lot of unknowns around this issue in particular. And I'm glad you mentioned Mark, because uh, my colleague, Greg Myrie is going to be talking with him after our session today. But let's just drill down for a second. You know, I'm, I'm curious, there have been um, sort of early on um, some ideas out there uh, that, and we'll say from informed sources, that, that there may be a nation state behind this, that Russia may be behind this. And there are a number of reasons why people are coming to that conclusion. Um, just given an, an understanding that you're not, you don't have immediate access to the classified information that is there today. But what would make you think that this would be some sort of nation state coordinated effort? Yeah, so my initial reaction way back uh, when we first detected these attacks in Cuba was that this just smelled of some Russian um, cloak and dagger aso asymmetric espionage operation. We, the Obama administration had, had developed a, a new line of policy on Cuba where we were going to um, establish relations. And that would have caused Russia a lot of concern. They would have wanted to break that up. And one way to do it would be to hit our people with these electro pulse magnetic, whatever, you know, microwaves in, in Cuba. And of course, we blamed the Cubans and, and closed our embassy, which is exactly what the Russians would want. Uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, we know him, his formative experiences, experience was serving in the KGB. So this is what he does. Uh, and having a, a, a capability like this would give him leverage in his relationship with the United States. He can't go toe to toe with us, uh, not with an economy the size of Italy's. No disrespect to the Italians, but Russia just doesn't have that ability. But where he levels the playing field is with espionage operations, and he's doing it worldwide. He's interfered in our elections. He's mounted all sorts of cyber attacks against us and our allies, he used banned chemical nerve agent. Uh, against Sergei Skripal in the UK with absolutely no concern about, about causing harm to innocent civilians and passersby who were also in, in harm's way. So those are just a few examples. I mean, downing a Malaysian airliner, it's just, you know, this is what Vladimir Putin does. So it was something that I could certainly see him doing, but you've got to go out and collect the intelligence to confirm. Uh, otherwise, it's just a theory. Exactly right. I, I think we can all agree that um, the Russian president is a great strategist, but that's not evidence. And that's been one of the issues with getting to the bottom of this, hasn't it? The fact that it's very difficult to catch anyone in the act, which is almost what you need to do, it seems like, um, as the intelligence community kind of digs in on this. Um, what are some of the what are some of the issues at play there with gathering evidence? And in a case like this, where it, it may be um, focused directly on U.S. diplomats or U.S. intelligence officers who are working in embassies, but there's really very little to go on. So I'm starting to understand why it's so difficult um, for the government to go out there with statements they might not know. Is that possible? So I think what the government has done a good job of is looking at the forensics, that is people who have been hurt and getting them into Walter Reed. I mean, we haven't been perfect at that, and it certainly took a long time, but a number of people, and Mark will talk about his experience um, soon, but we've gotten people in for uh, medical exams and that's forensics. That's helping us understand what they might have been subjected to. But then we need to collect intelligence to determine who's doing it in the first place. And I kind of liken this to, um, you know, some of the uh, hunting for spies that I was involved in um, at CIA, you know, we knew that we were losing our sources, for example, in the Soviet Union and in Russia, but we didn't exactly know why. And it wasn't until we collected the most sensitive intelligence we were able to prove it was Rick Ames or Robert Hansen. That's kind of what this is. Now, I'll caution everyone that intelligence doesn't deliver certainty. Just look at the Abbottabad raid where we killed bin Laden. We weren't certain he was there. You've got to make decisions uh, with a level of confidence. In fact, as, as my old boss, Michael Morell, former acting director of CIA, likes to say, as important as 
what you believe is how strongly you believe it. And so we need a level of confidence of low, medium, or high that it was Russia or China or perhaps them working together. We're assuming it's one country, could be a number of countries, could be state actors and non-state actors. Again, we just don't know. And that means that this is an intelligence gap. And until we solve it, uh, with all due respect to my former colleagues whom I revere and thank for their service, this is an intelligence failure. We've got to We've got to get this one figured out. So Dan, I think you'd, you'd probably be the first to say that um, the intelligence community is off uh, up against rather um, a pretty hefty expectation of always finding the answers to everything, um, even when it's incredibly difficult. What do you, what would you say should be going on right now for those of us who don't come from the intelligence community, who don't understand the way you do the tasks that they're up against? I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges in this specific case? Yeah, so I, I, I've done this a lot, you know, because I've been retired a couple of years now, and uh, I still wake up in the morning thinking, what would I do if I were still at CIA? And I miss the people, I miss the mission. So the first thing we would want to do is rally up all our stakeholders, try to seek out what we would call a 360 degree optic. That means getting our science and technology people so we could understand, you know, the the technology that might be involved in these attacks on our people. Um, mm -hmm. The Office of Medical Services, the folks who were telling us, well, this is these are the medical conditions that our officers are struggling with right now. So we understand that. Uh, we marry that up with the collection that we have that we could do against state, non-state actors. And we funnel what we call requirements to our collectors overseas in the field. And we think about, well, who would have access to the information if attacks are indeed taking place. And we would posit, for example, that the Russian military intelligence, the GRU might be behind this. Well, then we're going to pulse our sources and we're gonna to talk to our partners, our foreign liaison partners, the closest ones in NATO, for example, who may have collection on this. Um, the Canadians obviously have also been subjected to these sorts of attacks. What are they seeing? Uh, so the idea is to collect as much intelligence as possible. Be very wary about making interim judgments, those aren't super helpful. What is helpful is understanding what the gaps are and making this a high priority for our people to go out and collect intelligence, critical. Mm. You know, it, it's interesting because um, Senator Warner had also come out um, and talked about the fact that they haven't seen any sort of like bragging about this, which is I think one of the ways that both law enforcement and intelligence officials are able to figure out what's going on by monitoring the chatter. Um, it, it, what does that actually mean if they're if they're not picking up on usual channels? Is that surprising or perplexing to you? I, I, I don't know why he said that, frankly. Like, I don't know if we need to tell our adversaries where we're looking or what we expect to hear from them to confirm or not confirm that these attacks are taking place. Um, I, 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 that hasn't been the experience in my, you know, look, again, if it's like a mole hunt uh, akin to finding Rick Ames or Robert Hansen, which I think this is closest to that um, mm -hmm. in terms of the challenge that we're facing in the intelligence community, uh, bragging isn't gonna be what you're gonna see. You know, it's, it's not gonna be that. It, 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 it's probably not gonna be documents. It's probably going to be a source who's in the know. And if we, one of the concerns that I have is when we say we've made conclusions, then those who are in the know are gonna think, well, I don't know if I wanna go volunteer this information. You know, one of the things that, that's really important for our intelligence community, for CIA in particular, is, is to collect intelligence from, from volunteers, from people who show up and, and, and give us intelligence because they have access to really sensitive information and they need something in return for us. We don't wanna close off any of those avenues to people. We want people to know that this is, un, this is not yet solved and we need, um, we need help. It's what the FBI does. You know, when the FBI gets a lot of tips and a lot of people coming to them uh, with reports of criminal behavior, we kind of do the same thing at CIA. And, and I fear that we have kind of closed off that avenue a little bit, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I would see how that would impact uh, the mission overall. It, it is a bit of a terrifying um, development that, you know, is my own personal opinion because it's something that's hard to track. It's something that's very difficult to know who's behind it. Um, and it is having an impact. Um, clearly, there are dozens of cases that they haven't figured this out yet. And those people are suffering from very real symptoms. Um, so until we figure this out, it's almost the perfect weapon in a lot of ways. You, you mentioned that you closely align it to kind of the hunt for moles, but Dan, what are some of the outstanding um, sort of challenges in this one that may be different from the hunt for a mole where you've got 
communication so you can monitor. Um, you may have other electronic uh, things that you can monitor to try to track someone down on the financial side. What are some of the unique challenges with this particular case? Yeah, so you know the way we might catch a mole uh, that is a spy in the U.S. government. You don't catch a spy unless you've got a spy on in your adversary's intelligence service telling you who the spy is. But because we believe in due process in the United States, if you look back over the history of how we caught Rick Ames, yes, we might have known it was Rick Ames or at least believed he was the suspect, but we went and did years of uh, collection on him to prove the case. Because as I said, nothing in intelligence is, is a certainty. Uh, mm -hmm. What concerns me here is, and again, to get back to why there's the potential that this is a state actor, it looked to me like specific US government officials were being targeted at specific times and specific places. And mm -hmm. what that could mean if I'm thinking as a dark sider, somebody who served decades at CIA and spent many years on the Russia target and served many years in Russia, uh, what it could mean is that other sources are reporting to a state actor like Russia on where our people are, what their travel is, um, who is, who is um, where they're going to be and where therefore they might be particularly vulnerable to this sort of attack. That's what kind of caused me concern and also made me concerned that, that there really was some state actor behind this. This isn't indiscriminate. In other words, a terrorist attack could be very focused on a particular place as we saw on 9-11, but it's indiscriminate in the sense that there wasn't a specific person targeted on 9-11, it was our nation and, um, and a specific location. Here we're seeing specific individuals and Mark will talk about that in the next session. Um, and that takes, um, that takes a state actor with an intelligence service typically. Now, again, I'm making an assumption I would say I have a pretty like a medium level of confidence on that if I were gonna we're gonna give you one. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where we need more collection uh, and a lot of thinking and also maybe even some red teams. Think about if you go back, we know a number of these cases, let's say the 24 that are unresolved. We'll go back, I'm, I'm hoping we've done this, and look at them historically and try to understand how uh, where the vulnerable points were and how our adversary could have mounted these sorts of attacks against us and go to our foreign liaison government intelligence partners uh, and work these cases with them. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me to um, one sort of blaring fact out there that I'm sure everyone is paying attention to is that so far it seems to only be US citizens who are um, the victims of these kinds of attacks that develop these symptoms that have been reported, which, which does seem to kind of fall into the circumstantial maybe, um, but pretty strong circumstantial evidence that Americans are being targeted for this. Um, what do you think is going to happen if, uh, and this is a bit of speculation on this case, but I think it's important in kind of fleshing out the bigger national security threat. What do you think is going to happen if this goes on for another couple of years and whoever is behind this um, is seeing that there's really no downside to continuing um, attacks like these because no one can catch them? Yeah, I mean, for Everyone who thinks that that you know this is just these anomalous health incidents and they're not um, you know and it's not a state actor. Remember the Biden administration, President Biden warned Putin not to do it uh, at their summit in, in Geneva. So it, it is an issue there. Um, and the longer it carries on, obviously the greater concern we have uh, for our people uh, and the fact that it's not resolved. And the one thing about that, you know, that when you think about the state actors that would think about doing this to us, it's, I mean, I'll leave it to a lawyer, but it certainly looks like an act of war to me. And so you kind of have to have nuclear weapons if you're going to do this, because we know we're not going to war with Russia over this. Uh, but what we might like to do is catch one of their bad guys in the act, as we've done with their illegals, uh, going back, for example, in 2010, catch them in the act, throw them in jail, and, uh, and then have a more serious conversation with the Russians. But we're certainly not gonna go to war over this, even though you might argue that that's exactly what this is. Uh, but yes, the longer it goes on, as you correctly point out, uh, it's, it's taking up our time. And to, you know, in, the, in the intelligence community, there's, a, there's an opportunity cost. If we're doing this, then we might not be doing something else. And Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. would know that as well. Also, uh, that's a really important point to consider, Dan. Um, why the confusion um, over sort of how this has been reported and how these different reports are coming out at different times with different bits and pieces of information? Why all the confusion? 
I, I just don't think we're coordinating on our message very well. And I think, uh, honestly, I say this as a concerned citizen, I'd like to see the National Security Advisor, uh, Jake Sullivan, managing how the administration speaks out on this, why the CIA had an interim report and then the DNI had a report that seemed to contradict a little bit about, a little bit of what the CIA said. I just don't quite um, grasp that. It just makes things look a bit disjointed. Um, and, uh, and that's not good for the folks on the inside who are the ones doing the hard work on our behalf, you know, in, in tough places. Um, so yeah, I guess it's over to the White House to kind of fix the messaging on this and make sure, and I think our elected representatives with all due respect, Senator Warner included, you know, be careful what you, what you say and where you speculate uh, because we're all listening carefully, including the people who have been subjected to this, uh, this trauma. I think especially those people and their families also who have in some cases been subjected to this as well. Um, it, it does seem like in my decade um, of covering Washington and in particular the intelligence community that there is usually an explanation that is human in nature that there was a failure uh, to coordinate a report. Um, someone dropped the ball somewhere that that is a much uh, easier explanation to accept um, than anything sort of more sinister. We, we have heard um, when the current CIA, CIA director came into office that this was going to be a priority for him. Um, and, and there may have been, and now we're in pure speculation territory, but there may have been some pressure um, to produce something because people have been waiting for answers. It's all around a very difficult situation. But Dan, I just want to go back one more time to sort of like, you know, you, you did um, work in Russia, you did work in Moscow, and you, you have that suspicious mind by nature, given you know your past as a, an intelligence officer. What do you think are the next um, few steps that that should be taken in terms of information that's needed to actually get to a point where we can see less confusion around this? We can at least agree on what's known um, and get those people are obviously already getting help who have been affected. And Mark will talk more about that. But but what would you like to see happen next if you could choose three or four things? So first of all, take it out of the public eye for the moment here. I think that CIA interim report could have been delivered just to CIA officers or maybe just in the intelligence community, but we don't need to air it for the public as well as to our adversaries. If we believe that an adversary is targeting us, and I certainly believe that's the case, then what we don't need to do is issue interim reports. It's like we're grading Russia's homework if they're the ones responsible and that can only be helpful to them. It's like we're giving them our order of battle. So I would like to just, um, you know, I, I think it's important for House and Senate oversight to, to, to be tracking this really, really closely. But I also feel like um, until we have something definitive, we kind of need to take this in, in, inside, inside the IC and, uh, and, and leave it there until there's something more definitive. And I'd still like to see um, a statement from Director Burns and from DNI of Real Haynes that we are uh, focusing on this issue that we're that we're devoting our resources to uh, solving this mystery because nothing matters more than taking care of our people who are now all in harm's way and the thing about it is maybe it's only 24 people or maybe not maybe it's more who knows how many it is but it's everybody because you don't know if you're going to be the next one so if you're going overseas or reportedly if you're walking near the White House because there were two hits of people near the White House then you could be the next one. So it doesn't matter how few or how many of these there are. The fact that it's not solved is what is the real problem. And I think the first thing that I would like to see is manage your own workforce and deal with that, um, but keep the secrets for now. And the rest of us outside of the US government, well, we don't need to know right now, but you need to go and do the job that you do. And we're not privy to how you do it. We don't need to see how you do it. We don't need interim reports. Just go do the job and keep us safe. Yeah, I'm going to push back on you a little bit on that respectfully, because I think this is an issue that does need to be talked about, which is, you know, the government, if they take it out of the public eye, um, they're accused of, of you know, hiding something and keeping secrets. If they bring it into the public eye, they're scrutinized on, you know, is everything in place and, and do we have the level of confidence? Like there's an expectation level there that I think is difficult to match. We've seen recently with what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, the sort of coordinated release of intelligence. It's not a leak, but intelligence in ways that has never been done before. And I just wonder, um, is taking it out of the public eye the only option or are there opportunities here to do a more coordinated release of information? 
or if that's not happening, it, it, would that cause just more confusion at this point? Yeah, I just think the priority is getting to the facts and mm -hmm. getting to what we haven't done that. We have failed to determine mm -hmm. what's going on. And I think the priority is doing that. And I think when you shine a spotlight, um, I, I agree with your points. I would just be concerned that maybe we got to take the Hippocratic oath. This is a medical thing. Oh, don't do any harm to our collection efforts while we try to take care of our people the best we can. I totally agree with your with your points and the concern now that it's out anyways in the public. And we've mm -hmm. got people who are no longer working in the CIA or the State Department who were subjected to these attacks and they need to be kept abreast of whatever investigation is going on. But I'm just not sure that we need to be releasing reports, interim ones especially. As far as the intelligence on Ukraine is concerned, I would just say, I ran up against this a lot in Russia, you know, we all, all of our, lots of times our awesome State Department diplomats want to have a Cuban Missile Crisis moment, take our intelligence and share it with the Russians. And I used to say, you're going to tell them something they already know that they're doing against us to prove a point. And they like that because then they go find our sources and they cut them off or they put a bullet in the back of their head. So you got to be really careful about um, when you do that. And I, in the case of Ukraine, just to slightly, you know, move aside from this issue, but it's important because Vladimir Putin is the KGB operative in the Kremlin. I don't doubt that he's actually dialing up the tension against Ukraine, knowing that some of these things that he's saying that will never happen, like a fake propaganda video, uh, will be released and he'll be able to determine where that leak is happening and slice off that source. And he will have dialed up the tension in Ukraine and he wins by that. So we have to remember that our adversary is pretty wily if it is Russia and how we manage the collection uh, of intelligence is extraordinarily important because with all due respect, like we, you know, our administration, there isn't anybody who speaks KGB. You know, the last mm -hmm. one who was, you know, our last president who had served in director of CIA was President George Herbert Walker Bush. And Vladimir Putin's just kind of different the way he, the way he manages his affairs, as we all know. As we all know. And I think you just really perfectly highlighted how difficult uh, the business of intelligence is overall, uh, which I think is important for people to understand, because it, it may seem like from us on the receiving end of a, of a TV report or a newspaper article that, duh, this seems so simple, but it's never the case that it's that simple. And I don't think there's been a case um, more than the Savannah Syndrome incidents that we've seen that has highlighted just how complicated and difficult this can be. Um, I wanted to have just a couple of minutes and um, ask Dr. Deklova to come back in if there are questions um, from the audience before um, sure. before I use up all your time. Sure. It's fascinating. Thank you uh, both uh, Dan and Suzanne for kind of a wonderful 30,000 foot view of, of how our national security community and leaders all the way up to the president look at this problem, which is an intelligence challenge. And as you heard this morning, a medical intelligence mystery that uh, bedevils some of the top scientists positions in the country. A question, we have time for one question for Dan. Sean Guillory asks, there are a lot of stakeholders you talked about. We have a task force from Director Burns with the CIA, the State Department with Ambassadors uh, Moore and Uyahara, and recently President Biden named Maher Bitar at the National Security Council uh, as their lead, as sort of the czar for this. How? What advice would you give if you were on President Biden's intelligence advisory board today on how to coordinate these stakeholders so they work together optimally along with the scientific and medical community. If it were me, uh, gosh, I, this is extraordinarily like presumptuous of me in a way to think like this, but I'm gonna say what I would do is uh, I would have advised President Biden. I would have said, sir, um, designate someone at the NSC who is going to be responsible for this. Uh, who is going to manage our response to these attacks? Make and assure ensure that that person coordinates all the different agencies, uh, as well as all of those who have been stricken with these attacks. And here are the three questions I need answered: Who's doing it to us? Um, how are we going to catch them? And what are we going to do to stop future attacks? Ancillary please make sure you take care of everybody who's been, um, who's been attacked in this way. And anybody who says they were attacked were attacked until proven otherwise. I know one of the things that really hurts people and Mark will talk about this is when they're told that, no, you really weren't, a, you really weren't subjected to this Havana syndrome attack. And, and that's, 
you know, extremely painful, uh, psychologically painful for people who have been, um, who have been to Walter Reed and have traumatic brain injury to be, to be told that, you know, what they're feeling isn't actually true. Um, so those, that's what I would do. Make somebody, put somebody in charge and let them coordinate it. That would solve a lot of problems. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Suzanne and Dan. We're out of time.